Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Sue Hoxie. I'm executive director for Muslimu Association. Um, again, want to thank you for coming tonight, and our goal here tonight is to answer everyone's question about the proposed hut at Silver Lake. Um, I hope everyone is going to treat each other with uh, some respect and listen without judgment and interruption. Uh, a few logistics before I introduce everybody. Uh, if you need it, there's a bathroom here, there's a bathroom on the other side of the uh, door and the bar, and there are two more upstairs. I feel like an airline stewardess. Um, if you need a beverage, there are beverages next door. Uh, if your cell phone is on, could you uh, mute it or do not disturb, please? Um, tonight's meeting is being recorded courtesy of PEG TV. We've got Jimmy in the back there. Uh, it'll be available for viewing in a day or two, and we'll post a link on our website and send an email around uh, when it's available. So if you have a question tonight, please add your name to the sign-up sheet if you haven't already done so. Um, I have. The first couple pages here, the sign-up sheet is still by the, um, by the entry door. Um, and we hope to keep everyone's question and answer period limited to about five minutes. Uh, we've got quite a long list here, and uh, so as many people can participate. And we'll be passing around this microphone. So when you have a question, please use this mic so that we can uh, get it recorded. So uh, let me introduce tonight's players. Uh, we've got Chris Matrick from the Forest Service. He's the district ranger for the Rochester and Middlebury district. RJ Thompson, executive director with Vermont Huts Association. Angelo Lynn, board president of Muslim Association. And Bill Moore has kindly um, offered to serve as a moderator tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Hi, good evening everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, so I'm here to listen primarily to what folks have to say. Um, I won't take any like official comments. You'll have to use the comments that were in the scoping notice, that, that format to supply your comments, unless you have something written down you want to hand me, but I'm not prepared to like accept verbal comments tonight, but I will be taking some notes about what's being said. And I just want to step back and just kind of describe the process that we're going through right now. It's a typical environmental analysis. This is a, an ana environmental analysis for categorically excluded projects, and I can, I can go into that if someone wants to hear about what the, the nitty gritty behind categorically excluded projects is. But it is an environmental analysis, um, part of the National Environmental Policy Act. So what the, the typical flow of a special use permit application, which is what we have from Vermont Huts at this point, is um, we, there's, there's contact made from the proponent, in that case this is Vermont Huts, and they will describe to us, the Forest Service, what, you know, what they're thinking about. And um, we believe if it fits the management area direction and doesn't violate our forest plan or any law, regulation, or policy, we, we give them an application um, to fill out and they will propose what their project is. It then comes to the Forest Service and we screen it through some criteria just to make sure to just to double check that it meets our standards and our policies and things like that. And then um, we start the analysis process where a proposal is developed, our specialists, our resource specialists look at it, they determine whether there's gonna be any impact to their particular specialty, wildlife, plants, timber, recreation, soils. Um, and then once that as that analysis is working, we enter the scoping phase, which is what we're at right now. And that's what we released um, I guess about a week ago, maybe a little bit more, the scoping notice and invitation for public comment, which describes the, the, the proposal in detail and then gives you the opportunity to provide public comment to the Forest Service. And then once that information comes back to us, we get all those public comments um, and the analysis is complete. We do a content analysis on those comments to determine whether are there are any substantive issues of natural resource concern that would affect the project or if someone's raised a substantive issue that would cause us to raise the level of analysis, like go from a, from a categorically excluded decision to uh, environmental analysis. Um, and that, that has not happened in the past. We couldn't, I had a question from, I think it was Galena who asked me a question about that, whether that had happened in the, whether I could recall a, a time where 
the analysis level was raised on an originally proposed categorically excluded project. And um, our forest planner and myself couldn't think of one on the Green Mountain National Forest where that had occurred. That's not to say that it couldn't occur. You know, if we were suddenly to find a new federally listed plant species at this location, we clearly couldn't go forward without doing an environmental analysis, but we, we don't, environmental assessment, but we don't have that um, situation presently. So right now we're in that scoping phase. It's 45 days. I think we're about a week to two weeks into it. It's going to go for another 30 days after this um, meeting tonight. Um, and then, like I said, we'll, we'll look at all those comments, we'll consolidate them, look at them, and then I'll weigh all the factors involved, and I'm the lucky guy who makes a, gets to make the decision in the end as to whether we implement, or uh, we change course, we kind of fall back and regroup, or we turn it down. And th those are all the options that I have at that point, at that decision point. So, I have a lot of other information here about the, the beginnings of the Musulmu National Recreation Area and where it came from, and some of the standards and guidelines and the goals and objectives that are set forth in our forest plan for that but I'm not gonna bore you with that right now because really what I'm here for is to listen to what you have to say tonight. But if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer it. So now I think I'm passing it to, who am I passing it to? RJ? RJ. Um, there's a question. I'm gonna try not to trip over that cord. Yes, yes. A brief, a brief question. Where can we submit comments? Yeah, if you, I, I have the sheet right here that has the information on that. So I'm, I'll be standing over here if you wanna come on over and I will um, give you that information. Okay. Where'd he go? There it is. Well, I, have, I have one more thing before RJ goes. So that, so you probably presume this is what I said, but like no decision will be made tonight. Like we're not making a decision one way or the other tonight. It's purely informational. I just don't want to get that thought in somebody's head that we're going to like change course tonight or drop something tonight. We're going to look at all the comments and the information before we make any decision. Thanks, Chris. Folks hear me like this? Okay. Good evening. My name's RJ Thompson. I'm the executive director of Vermont Huts Association. We're a 501c nonprofit organization based in Stowe, though the huts in our network span across the state. Our mission is to provide an enriching and immersive outdoor experience for everyone. By collaborating with our partners in recreation, we are creating a four season hut network across the Green Mountain State to foster a deeper appreciation of our natural environment. When all said and done, the network will allow trail users an opportunity to traverse the entire state using huts as their refuge along the way. So what exactly is a hut? Ask 10 people and you'll probably get 10 different answers. I can tell you what a Vermont hut is. It is a heated structure with a size and design that fits with Vermont's landscapes. Our smallest hut, owned and operated by a mom and pop on private land, sleeps four guests. Our largest hut, the Chittenden Brook Hut, located on Green Mountain National Forest land, sleeps 10 guests, though its average group size is about six people. Some huts are old and uninsulated historic structures. Others are new, using modern day building techniques to create an energy efficient building. We've hosted guests as young as three months old to 82 years of age. Many families use our huts because their young children are simply not capable of carrying the gear necessary to camp in the backcountry. And some families simply do not have the financial resources to purchase all the gear required for a backcountry trip. Some may simply not know where to start. Because new huts are ADA accessible, we can also welcome folks with mobility challenges. Huts provide a stepping stone to ensure the outdoors are more accessible for all. Our huts also serve as the launching point for our forest program, which brings underrepresented community members into the backcountry with accommodations, a field naturalist, gear, food, and transportation, all free of charge. This not only creates a more inclusive outdoor space, but it plants the seed of environmental stewardship in a group that might have otherwise been forgotten. So how do we make this happen? <laughs> we partner with other nonprofit organizations, public land managers, and private landowners to identify viable hut locations for the enjoyment of the recreating public. When considering a hut site, we gather input from local trail stewards and volunteers, such as the Muslimu Association, as well as our public land managers. 
these individuals have a keen understanding of their area's existing recreational infrastructure, which is why we're here today. The proposed Silver Lake Hut provides year-round access for multiple user groups using existing U.S. Forest Service infrastructure. The public will not be able to drive to the hut. They must reach the area just like any other camper by foot. There is no balcony on the hut, but it does have a screened-in porch on the ground level to keep pesky insects away during the summer months. The hut is 1.5 stories tall, not two. The upper level has five-foot-high eave walls, I meaning you can't really stand on the side of the hut. It is considered a loft space with bunks. The total footprint of the proposed hut is 512 square feet. That includes the connected screened-in porch. So the living area inside is 16 by 24. <clears throat> yes, the hut uses propane for heat and its small cooktop. The propane heat source is used for safety reasons, as not everyone is familiar with or comfortable operating a wood stove. A pellet stove or heat pump are not viable alternatives, as they require a power source to operate. Should new heating technology become available in the future, we will gladly review their viability in this hut. The info packet contains critical information related to the hut, and I'm sure there will be plenty of questions, so I'll leave it there for now and hand it over to Angela. Thanks, Sergeant. Hopefully there's enough light for me to read this, <laughs> my aging eyes. So I'm Angelo Lynn, uh, president of the Muslim Association. Uh, thanks for coming tonight and offering your comments. For those who don't know me, I've lived on Lake Dunmore for the past 20 years and have had the pleasure of looking at Chandler Ridge each morning I'm there. I've run the trails during long distance training in years past, biked them and have skied them uh, since moving here in 1984. I love the area. And let me acknowledge that all of us here are here because of our mutual love of the Muslim area and of Silver Lake in particular. The 11 board members of the Muslim Association wouldn't contribute all the volunteer hours that we do if we didn't think this area was special and endearing in its many ways. As board members, we volunteer to clean the trails of trash, we clear up fallen trees, fix broken bridges, repair trail washouts. Collectively, we contribute hundreds of hours of volunteer work on a trail each year. We're a member-based associ association, and by the way, we'd love to have anyone here join our efforts and our association. It's 45 bucks a year, so it's not that expensive. So please welcome everybody. We have lots of work to do. We love the area. It's a great place to be. Of all the things the Musumu is, it's important to note that it is not a wilderness area, but it's a recreation area with educational opportunities and uses. How it is used and the appropriate balance of that use is always a legitimate conversation to have. And we're here tonight to discuss that balance. First, let me emphasize that the public review process is an important part of the uses of public lands. It's orderly, it's systematic, and there are tried and true purposes. It is by nature a listening process. If any of you have worked with the Forest Service on such projects, it's anything but rushed or secretive. As a board, we've been talking about this project for more than a year and have been following their process. We're now in that public comment period. So like I said, there's nothing secretive or hurried about it. It may seem that way if you haven't heard about it before, but it's been dealt with in a public way for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I'll keep my mouth closer to that thing. We're also holding the public hearing, not because it's part of the Forest Service process, it is not required, but because we as two nonprofits want to be as transparent as possible and to be respectful of opposing comments. As Chris noticed, I think earlier, the Forest Service is here as our guest to answer questions but it's not part of that process. So let me briefly tell you how we arrived at our decision to
to locate a hut within the Moose Moon National Recreation Area. To, be, to begin, we recognize that the Silver Lake area is underused uh, during the six to seven months of the winter. Oh, I'm sorry, it's underused. It's underused? Excuse me, I'll move that closer. During the six or seven months of the winter, from mid-October through May. Uh, while the Blueberry Hill area has some winter traffic, most of the area of the Muslimu is rarely traveled in the winter. And as backcountry enthusiasts, we're aware, we are well aware of the Vermont Hut Association and its mission, and how it has recently worked with the Forest Service to build the Chittenden Brook Hut. As their goal is to have huts along the Green Mountains to support hut, hut travel, locating a hut in this vicinity of the Muslimu, which is an easy day's walk or ski from the Chittenden Brook Hut, makes sense. So Chris looked there, heard our kind of conversation, agreed it would be an appropriate idea to pursue, and so we visited several sites within the Muslimu. Silver Lake, Muslimu Campground, Goshen Reservoir, and somewhere near the top of Brooks Road. Um, Chris listened to our list of options, went over them with us, and basically said at the end of the day, that the MR, the National Recreation Area had enough privies uh, and he didn't want to build any more and for us to locate this hut near the existing privies, the concrete privies that are out there. Um, and, it, and that limited it to the Moose Moo Campground and to Silver Lake where there are existing concrete privies on site. And of the two, Silver Lake had better parking both for the summer and the winter. There's virtually no parking at the Moosmo campground in the winter, as you know. Um, so then next we looked at various sites at Silver Lake, and again kept the locations within easy walking distance of the established toilet, but far enough from the lake shore that it couldn't be seen. Those were two priorities that we had. And that's the project we're now discussing. As a board member and part, as a board and a partner with the Forest Service, the Moose and Moose Association also has a broader mission than the individual user to the Silver Lake area. That mission, in short, is to encourage appropriate use of the MNRA to the wide, widest segment of the population in ways that enhance the public joy, public's joy of the area. When I say public joy, that includes use in terms of year-round access as well as an appropriate preservation of the wild environment, at least as wild as it gets on those very popular trails. Personally, and as a board, we also believe that Vermont benefits from a hut-to-hut -hut system similar to those in Maine and New Hampshire, and that the hut at Silver Lake could be part of that system. It's a bit off trail, off the long trail, but if through hikers are relaxing for a couple of days and can spend, spend it in a scenic spot like Silver Lake, halfway along their hike, what a beautiful spot to rest and recover. So finally, it would enable us to, to expand our educational mission to area youth by making it available on a subsidized basis and to underrepresented people in the backcountry. And would give us another way to broaden the public's awareness of who the MA is and what we do. As for the HUD itself, we believe it will offer additional access to the backcountry to a broader group of people. A hut makes camping affordable for people who don't want to invest in the gear. A hut is great for older folks who don't want to haul in the equipment. I'm getting there. And a hut is great for young families who like the security of four walls and don't want to have to deal with the bears. Finally, let me address a few unfair comments and misinformation that was distributed early on in the campaign opposing the hut. And this is just a kind of put on the record that we do oppose those comments. We didn't make a big deal of it at the time, but don't feel that they should be left out there unaddressed. Um, first, that the project was held in secret. Second, that the people needed to rush to save the lake from the ruinous project. And third, that the Moose Moose Association was desperate for funding. The last one came out more recently. Uh, by now, I hope you've seen that the hut was neither rushed nor secretive. It's a process that you go through and it is a well-established Forest Service process, and we were just following that process. Um, as for the funding, the Moose Moose Association has been operating on a budget of less than 10,000 for almost the past 20 years, and, and we've been doing fine. 
we've taken on more work the last five years because of some extra funding and it would be nice to have more funding because we're doing more work we've, we've contributed about three million dollars worth of trail work and funding and improvements to the area in the last five years so that takes volunteer time and staff time and effort um, and you know I just want to say we know why these bits of mis misinformation particularly early on uh, were made and we're well aware of that it's you get followers to get followers organizers need to make an alarming case and you know the press gets charged with this all the time you know sensational headlines Th that's because it works if you go out there and say hey there's might be something that might make Silver Lake less desirable you're not going to get a response so, so I get it it's in and I think the other part of this is seeking to discredit uh, the opponent and you know that's just it's a fact of political life today you see it with our ex-president he's really good at it <laughs> we all hope we don't have to go there but you know when you make them your foes when you make the opponent your enemy it's easier to attack them and so um, you know we hope that doesn't go further from here we do want to uh, I, I think one of the things I'll mention is a email comment that was out there in the chain of emails that, that wrote that she was concerned that the MR, MNRA president is the publisher of the Addison Independent and, and that the VHA executive director RJ is also on our board and and then by association she said I don't need I don't think I need to tell anyone how capitalism and the press works hand in hand and then referred to readers to an article in the Boston Globe about this entrepreneur from Belarus who's made tons of money and I thought to myself which you know, this is kind of guilt by association but I thought to myself man I'm either really bad at this job <laughs> or or maybe it doesn't translate to community journalism uh, but I think maybe the latter uh, but I haven't been able to capitalize on my relationships and, and I don't think many of us are in here to do that. So hopefully we can move past this part of it. We can be friends. We can understand that why we're here is to protect an area and, and uh, you know, build an area that we all love and respect and want not to see ruined in any way. And we're all with you on that point. Uh, so I hope in tonight's meeting uh, we can have a good give and take. We listen to each other respectfully and uh, we move forward uh, as friends and colleagues. Thank you very much. So this is rules of engagement. That is why I'm here to be the enforcer. No, listen, we're all here because we love the, we love where we live, right? We want an opportunity to be heard and to ask questions. It's an opportunity to ask the people that are making decisions or have made these decisions questions. And we're going to do it in a relatively orderly fashion. And by my count, right now, there's about 28 people that have written down that want to speak. So if you each get five minutes, we're going to be here for a while. So I ask that. If you have a question, ask it. Preambles are great. It's great to talk about how passionate it's, I mean, the fact that you are here makes you passionate, right? The fact that you're here on a beautiful June day, yes, there's mosquitoes, but the fact that you're here on a beautiful June day speaks to that passion. So again, if we can keep it to five minutes or below when you go to ask your question, that'd be fantastic. And so, without further ado, Kathy, you're fairly close on that opportunity so make sure you keep that question in your mind Warren Foster Warren Foster everybody I'm gonna hand the microphone so we got the microphone hey thanks Warren again see how I'm parking it on my partner right here this is how you're gonna be here I don't have a beard you don't have a beard I don't know I see some stuff huh? good evening I'm Warren Foster um, full disclosure I am the secretary treasurer of the Muslim Blue Association and have been probably for more than a decade so I, I uh, 
we'll be able to take questions that might be related to our finances, I suppose, later on. But I'm speaking personally right now. Um, having grown up in Middlebury on a farm, I didn't have much free time to go to Silver Lake until probably I was 16. I've been going there for the last uh, 53 years. Uh, I was even there one time camping, and I'm pretty sure I was the only person there, and it was not winter. Um, most recently, I uh, walked the perimeter trail with some friends, and we found, I think, 24 pink lady slippers. Ran into another friend on the way out. She said, I know where there's some yellow lady slippers, so we saw another half dozen of those. They're fading fast, so if you want to see them, you've got to get up there. But speaking uh, more objectively over the years, um, when you first started up the trail from Lake Dunmore side, there used to be uh, a big sign that said uh, something about Silver Lake Oasis of Solitude. And I always loved that phrase, Oasis of Solitude. And um, I think that can still be achieved at certain times of the week, certain times of the year. But as we all know, it's getting to be a very popular place. But as I go up the hill and approach Silver Lake, um, first thing I notice is the old pipeline. It's called the new pipeline, but there was an old pipeline made of wood staves back in the 60s. And then I see a, a major power distribution transmission line that passes over the north end of the lake. And today I see a, a lean-to there. They, there used to be a camper there. Following that, I'm finding uh, picnic tables that pretty much always been there. Um, an outhouse, a, 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 bill, a billboard, which is quite nice now with the history of the uh, hotel that used to be there 100 years ago. And um, as I walk around the north edge, I've got uh, the concrete sluiceway, which has always been there, uh, leading, uh, bringing water from the pipeline at the reservoir down to Silver Lake. As you know, it's a, it's a, it's a metal hydro facility for the uh, power station down at the lake. And as I walk around, I, I run into one of the um, concrete outhouses. If, if you don't believe it, just go up and knock on any part of that building and it's concrete 100%. Um, and as I walk down the, uh, would be the east shore, there are the signs um, for the campsites. And uh, then walking around the lake, we've got the, you know, the various signs telling you some, uh, some nice nature notes uh, that the Forest Service installed recently. So all those things are really there, but subjectively, I don't really notice them anymore. I mean, I, you know, most of them have been there, you know, the lake is still pristine in the sense that there's nothing on the shore. It's a wooded shoreline and uh, as far as the proposal of the HUD, that's going to stay the same. All the things I've listed are still going to be there. And the shoreline will still be uh, untouched by camp no campsites, uh, no structures other than what you see um, on the north end. So that's the only point I wanted to make. Um, and if I still have a minute, um, following up on something that um, Angelo said, one of the reasons um, we have a budget. Every time we do a project in the Forest Service, we're typically using Forest Service grant money that's come down through from Congress. But as a partner organization, we have to supply 20%. So if it's a $10,000 bridge, which actually is cheap these days, they're more like 20,000, we have to come up with 20%. And we do that with volunteer hours rather than taking money out of our pocket. So um, I just wanted to add that because it's, it's critical to the sort of the why we need, we do need money to accomplish all the things that we do. And I think other people tonight will, um, well that's great, I'm done. All right, so we're giving a passionate uh, speech which was great. Uh, however, again, like we, we, we all love Silver Lake. Let's try to keep it to questions. Again, we've got a ton of people that want to speak. And in fact, our next person to speak will be David Stewart. David Stewart, where are you? All right. Karina, okay, so. Yeah, just, just, I mean, maybe, I mean, yeah. I don't need to go to the podium. For anybody who's going to speak tonight, 
you need to grab the mic so that we can have okay. the recording. Okay, great. And I'll turn my voice down. <laughs> um, so some of the um, questions that I have have to do with um, the categorical exclusion part of it. And um, I think it's very important to note that in the language of the categorical exclusion, which I actually wrote down, there are um, the actual the federal guidelines do say that there are things that should be considered in determining whether this kind of exception makes sense. And one of those things has to do um, is very specifically about a national recreation area. And um, I also have, so I'm wondering if we'll be able, and I'm not expecting answers today, but my concern would be why is the, why wouldn't we be going through an environmental impact part of this? Also, um, has anyone made contact with the Abnaki? Because I believe that um, the Abenaki actually have. Um, Please your computer. We cannot hear anything. We're very frustrated. We haven't heard a single thing. Please don't take your computer. 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 Please don't take investigation, a full EIS, how anyone would know whether there will be, what kind of limits to impose on a hut in terms of um, impact to species, to, you know, when you're going to use a pile driver down there, how are you going to get the pile driver in order to put in that foundation, what is that going to mean for the road, for runoff, um, those are all questions that I have. Another point that I think is really important because people have brought up the idea of this creating accessibility, and that Silver Lake is not a place that someone who has issues with mobility is going to get to unless there's a lot more infrastructure. A Vermont hut built on Silver Lake with an ADA ramp is a wonderful idea and there is no way, unless they are going to really redo the roads and the trails from Leicester to get those there. And I think that's a very important point. Um, so I think, I think, oh, I also wonder why haven't, have, 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 has anyone looked at putting lean-tos there? I also wanted to point out that there are other organizations that actually let people use equipment. I actually worked for one for a long time, and we brought kids and supplied them with everything, whole families with everything. So that is not a new, generous idea by, by anyone. That is something that happens quite regularly already. Um, and I'm wondering about other sites. I understand the idea of the privy being important, but would it actually be more accessible to have a hut up on Hogback, for instance, or someplace else? Um, I think Silver Lake is not an accessible location. It means people who are already really good at hiking, especially in the winter, are going to go down that steep mountain or up that steep side to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, there were some questions in there, Chris. Did you want to answer or address any of those questions and, and RJ? So Yeah, I, I certainly I certainly can, although I don't want to eat into people's I, I know you want answers, but I don't want to eat into Can you people's go to the time. Microphone? The microphone is coming to me. It's there. I, yeah, I can answer some of those questions, but I'm just not sure whether you want me to in the context of this and eat into other people's time where they have the opportunity to answer questions. So I'll do my the best I can on on short notice, on a, on a short time frame. The Abnaki will be consulted with our, our forest archaeologists will, will consult with the Abnaki. That's part of our process. That's one of those, you talked about like how we could do a categorical exclusion when you have to have these relationship to extraordinary circumstances and one of them is national recreation areas and there's wilderness, then there's uh, American Indian tribe, there's a whole slew of them, there's seven or eight of them. So it's not that that, that um, circumstance is present, it's if you would negatively affect the character of that circumstance. So if we were to come in and we were somehow negatively affecting the National Recreation Area through the placement of this hut, then, then we would have to consider, okay, we're, 
we're violating the extraordinary circumstance rule and we would have to consider doing a, a higher level analysis. So in this case, it's not, this actually fits very well with the focus and goals of the National Recreation Area. Um, the, yes, the I, I would like to say, though, that in, in, in answering questions, if, if an opinion is stated by the answerer and not given time, I think you're going to run into a lot of back and forth because already there is room for disagreement with one of the points that you made, just right. respectfully. And I don't feel like I'm going to go into that, but I think in terms of moderating, it, it's a big question. But okay, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what you thought I stated was an opinion, but that's okay. That you think that, um, that there does not, that you already know that there doesn't need to be, that it can be a categorical exception um, because none of those listed things are going to be impacted severely. That was the suggestion. Yeah, so that's not, that's not we we are resource specialists and the folks in charge of that have reviewed those things and they've determined that there's not any any relationship to, negative relationship to those extraordinary circumstances. That's not to say that something might not come up in the comments that would point out some other situation that might think, might make us think about upping the analysis, so to speak. And the environmental impact? Yeah. And the environmental impact? You have to have, have you, have, have you actually done an environmental impact statement? No, no. The environmental impact statement is the highest level. That's when you know you're going to have a significant impact yeah. on natural resources. So the determination thus far through our analysis is there is not that situation. And that's based on your opinion? All that's that's based on my professional resource staff and my role as the responsible official for the project. Yep. Um, is it? Have we satisfied the questions that were asked as a part of that? Uh, RJ, did you want to speak to this as well? Accessibility. Accessibility piece is being addressed by RJ from the Hunt Association. In case you didn't know. Um, so I, I appreciate that comment, and I, it's one that um, you, you often hear. Uh, why why would there be an accessible hut located? on a trail, well um, uh, one, uh, who are we to say what someone with mobility impairments can or cannot do? There have been instances where folks have made it into the backcountry and unfortunately it rides at structures that are not accessible and so it creates a more welcoming experience for them wherever these huts are located on public lands. Furthermore, there is a way for folks to get down to the structure utilizing existing forest service road infrastructure. Um, there are adaptive bicycles that allow folks to travel over um, mountain bike terrain. Um, and means that road would be open. That to pedestrian. Not, open. Not, not to motorize. To pedestrian traffic and, and cyclists. And that's all I wanted to mention. There will be no public vehicular access again to Silver Lake Hut. Thank you, RJ. And the next person, Dan Brush. Dan Brush. I met him. This gentleman right here in the middle. Did you want to speak, Dan? My name is Don Brush. If you could get that mic a little closer to your face, that'd be fantastic. My Just name is Don Brush. Yeah, Don Brush. I'm probably, heritage-wise, the closest resident to where you're talking about uh, for time of the memorial. Number of generations. You hold the mic microphone a little closer, bro. I respect the motivation of all the people that are here and the reasons for doing it. I think the hut system is a good idea. I'm not sure that it belongs at Silver Lake. And the reasons for that are as follows. <clears throat> My family heritage goes back to the era when the Chandlers ran the hotel there. We've been through these kinds of meetings four times that I'm aware of, two times in my lifetime. Fortunately, uh, Silver Lake was spared the situation of being a developed lake. As such, it remains a jewel, pretty easily accessed with a half an hour's walk, maybe less for some of you, to get there, but it's still 
pristine. And it only happened because a few people took the initiative to make, make it that way. So the claps are eating into his time. Just let you guys clap after if you get to Frank, Frank Chandler started the thing. Fortunately, it was not passed down, and the, and the, the hotel disappeared in 1946, I believe. Uh, the Chandlers were friends of my family's. Uh, we have many relics of the hotel. Um, at any rate, to go further, there was a small group of people in Brandon that wanted to develop that area. And they were talked out of it by local friends. And fortunately, the U.S. Forest Service stepped up to take responsibility for the area back in the 40s. And since that time, I'm uh, concerned to say it's the, the service has attacked or allowed uh, challenges to the pristine area up there. They wanted to expand the, the, uh, the campsites. They wanted to put in a road and access for boating. Fortunately, those things didn't happen. And one of the reasons that Silver Lake is what it is today is because those things didn't happen. It's not Lake Dunmore. It's not a developed piece of property. And once you start down the road, yeah. you can't go back. Yeah. In, this, in this particular instance, we were lucky because of the Chandler family and what took place by a small group of people. So we have a jewel, it's very close. It's close to my heart. I know it in the winter, I know it in the summer. Um, it's unlike many other similar situations in the state, small ponds and so forth, that have been developed and have been exclusive and they, they became exclusive to the population. Silver Lake is not exclusive to the population. It has become overused. The adjoining parking lot at Silver Lake adjoins my land. And within the last 10 years, the encroachment on my property has been significant. It encroaches on the, the main road, on my property. I'm habitually having to clean up the mess that's there uh, up to and including drug paraphernalia, people selling drugs there regularly, uncontrolled. It's a nuisance. Expanding the access to the place in summer and winter does not help that situation. There's not room for it. It's already overpopulated. 20, 25 seconds, just give you that. Okay. I think that a better location, more accessible, like Muslimu or on the backside of Goshen Dam, you could create a parking place and access and still preserve the jewel that you have without developing it. And I would like to see this group, these groups, investigate those options or if they're not, I would like to see and ask how they're going to deal with the situation I'm describing because I don't think I'm the only landowner that's being affected here and I was not contacted ever until they were sawing trees down on my property. So thank you, Dan. Thank you. applause comes. Right in the middle of the end. That's where you are. The applause. Applause. So, all right. So we have Dan. Ashley Wolf. No, no. Okay. All right. No. Again, some people signed this just thinking it was a sign and they had to sign it. So, Linda Andrews. Linda Andrews. Linda Andrews. Thank you. Um, I'm Linda Andrews. Is that mic on? I'm sorry. That seemed like late. Hit the button on the side there. It looks like it's blinking. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. 
I'm Linda Andrews. I was raised in Middlebury, worked internationally for 28 years, and then now retired in Bristol. I was fortunate that my family owned a summer camp at Lake Dunmore when I was growing up. I spent every summer living on the lake until I was 21. Silver Lake was where we, we loved to hike and to explore. Silver Lake has remained, through my lifetime, my favorite destination to hike in all seasons. I want to see Silver Lake area be preserved and, and protected. I feel the hut, which is really a four season rental house, would first and foremost disturb the wildlife and habitat and take away the peace, solitude, beauty of the area which we all enjoy. Over the years, I have seen a steady increase, as Don has talked about, in the number of people hiking to Silver Lake. It is popular because it's an easy day hike for most people. You don't have to spend the night to see it. However, it appears that it is now overutilized based on the growing number of cars in the Lena Falls parking lot. In fact, trees have recently been cut down, I didn't know it was on Don's property, to help accommodate for more cars. When considering this project, I feel the following should be done. You should really conduct an objective needs assessment. Is the house really wanted and needed by the local community and organizations? Has the underserved population and those disabled been surveyed? The assessment should include public hearings in person and via Zoom, since many people do not live near the lake and some live outside the state. I think, too, you should conduct an environmental impact assessment. Loons. How will the project affect a pair of loons nesting and raising their young in the lake? I fear the next step is to supply boats for the renters. How will that affect the loons? One of the attractions of the lake is to see the loons. Lady slippers. Will this, will this, will this threaten the existence of the uncommon lady slippers? We know that there are lady slippers, as we've already mentioned, and there's also yellow ones, which are very uncommon and rare. What will be the impact of the noise and destruction of the environment when bringing in equipment and building a house? They have permission to cut down 20 trees. What will be done with the wastewater after cleaning the dishes, pots, and pans? Where will it go? Into the lake? Then I think that you should evaluate the lessons learned from the other similar huts. A DA rental at Chittenden Brook is known to be used as a party house, leaving their trash behind and scattered in the woods. The hut is easily accessible and is cheap when the rent is shared among many people. Do we want a party house at Silver Lake with noise that will disturb the wildlife and other campers? Then the uh, Chinden Reservoir uh, uh, hut, which wasn't BAA, but burnt down due to the propane. How could we manage a fire at Silver Lake? It is the beauty of Vermont and the forests that draw people to Vermont. Let's protect and preserve it. Recreation in the national forest is to observe quality, to, to observe quietly the beauty of the woods, identify the birds, plants, and flowers. It is a place to study nature and learn how everything is interconnected. I do fear that this four season house is approved that the income from the rental will go to build more of the type of hut. What is the need and impact of these huts? There should be an overall vision and plan. The forest is not for humans to profit from. We must carefully consider what we are, what we do, and protect our valuable resource. Thank, thank you, Linda. And uh, Chris has a comment. Yeah, just just a correction. So um, the Chittenden. Brook Hut is located at Chittenden Brook Campground. It's not on Chittenden Reservoir. It's, it's off Forest Road 45 in Rochester. There, it is not known as a party spot, and there is not trash scattered in the woods. There are dump, two dumpsters, a recycling dumpster and a trash dumpster, almost virtually right next to it. It's cleaned up um, by the caretaker of the hut and also by our staff as well. So that, that, is, that is inaccurate. Um, that, the, the lodge that was burnt down at Chittenden Reservoir on the, on the South Pond tract was arson. Um, and that was related to a personal dispute. Um, and, and Don, I just want to go back because you said trees that were cut on your land, and we had this conversation out there that day. So it's, we weren't cutting trees on his land. There was some dispute when they moved the road, did the property line move with it? So the land is currently, if you look at the surveys and the property, property maps, it's US Forest Service land. But there is some question as to whether a mistake was made in the past. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. so 
Thank you, and thank you again, and thank you for keeping it on your time, by the way. It was fantastic. We, we have cleaned it up. I was, I was up there. You mean, the, you, you mean the, well, I wasn't there this afternoon, but it has been cleaned up on a regular basis. So, moving on. Thank you. And, Oh, RJ, you wanted to... I just want to echo what Chris mentioned about Trinity Brook Hut. We have a caretaker, a weekly caretaker, who visits that hut once a week. He not only checks the hut's interior, but its surroundings. Um, and I have never heard reports from the caretaker of trash scattered outside. Describing our structures as houses is extremely misleading. These are completely off the grid, and they have no running water. Uh, just want to put that on the record. Okay, so moving on. Linda uh, Galena. Lena's coming up front. You want to use this microphone or that microphone? This, this, one. this, is, this is the one that's going to be talking most, the most light, the recording. No, because it's so dim. Let me turn my flashlight on my... It's so dim that I cannot see anything. So I'll have to use that. So which one? This one here. Okay, my name is Galina Chernaya. Some of you may have heard of me. Um, I know a few people in the audience, uh, but I'm glad to meet everyone. Um, I do have a long list of concerns. However, with the five minute limit, I had to pick just one. And it won't be very exciting or a lot of emotion. It's gonna be getting into the weeds and talking about concepts which are not familiar for most of you, but which Chris knows very well. With that, I'll start with the um, scoping letter. Uh, one of the sections says, forest plan, forest plan compliance. Uh, recreational facilities may be provided to enhance the visitor's experience at special uh, specific at attractions. Recreation management will be towards the desired ROS objectives of roaded nature. To me, it's gibberish. So I had to look it up, and what I found out was that ROS stands for Recreation, thank you, that's very helpful, Recreation Opportunity Spectrum, which offers a framework for understanding relationships between natural settings and visitors' experiences. There is a document, and Chris knows that document, I believe, very well, which is called ROS Primer, and field guide. Within that document, all uh, recreation sites, natural settings, are split into six classes, from primitive to urban. So uh, the one that was referring road at natural is right in the middle. So between the primitive and the urban. Within the same document, there is uh, there are norms set for every feature of this class. So let's say remoteness, access, so socialization opportunities. But we'll look just at one, which is about structures. So what is a norm? What is considered a norm for a structure with an eroded natural class? So that structure, and I'm reading, is a rustic structure providing some comfort to the user. Rustic structure provided some comfort to the user. We can argue, and some people may have one perception of what some comfort is. However, rustic structure <laughs> is pretty defined. Rustic, a definition, simple, unsophisticated. If you look at the picture, that's just a small one, and you go outside, ask 10 people, if anyone will characterize or describe this uh, structure as rustic, I will be really surprised. <laughs> However, Chris, when he came to the, the town of Goshen select board meeting, and first time told shocked audience that there will be, uh, there is a proposal about the hut, and I will quote from the minutes. Chris stated that the Muslim Association is looking at putting a year-round cabin at Silver Lake. It will hold eight to 10 people, and it will be a rustic structure. Because Chris knows that in this plan, in this ROS guide document, rustic structures are norm for this class. 
I have a nice, very nice schematic from the same guy. Unfortunately, I was not um, granted a presentation uh, opportunity. And here you, I have many of them. You can see for yourself. So here's the road at Natural, where Silver Lake is. And the little, little picture shows two hikers in the tent. This structure looks amazingly similar to one is proposed. And that belongs, is a norm for the next up class, which is rural. So basically, Chris, you're... Um, Galena, you have 40 seconds left. Okay, so you are not aligning with the plan. So what, okay, I'll just finish up with that. So the next revision for the plan is coming up. And I'm wondering whether you will be considering to let, reclassify it even further to rural. If not, we disagree. And I think it's a st uh, time for, to you, for you to take a step back and for get all involved, all interested parties together to develop a long-term vision for Silver Lake area. And only after that vision is developed, all the projects proposed or anticipated should be decided on whether to move them forward or not. So let's work together. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Oh, let me shut off my timer. All right. Um, Chris, did you have a response? Um, no, I don't have any specific response because I don't, I don't want to speak to the up. I don't want to speak to the ROS issue because of the recreation opportunity spectrum issue because I don't have that information with me, so I don't want to misspeak. Um, and we, we did, um, how, how many years ago, we did convene a group to talk about the Moose Saloon National Recreation Area. And we had several strategic planning meetings when we invited a whole bunch of people, probably some of the people in this room, were at those meetings, partners, individuals, government agencies, to talk about future management of the Moose Saloon National Recreation Area. And we did, um, we did develop uh, a strategy of sorts at that time. It wasn't specific to Silver Lake, um, but we did for the National Recreation Area. Thank you. Too, no, no, too many mics, too many mics. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Sherry and Bernard Humiston. We're good. Okay, all right. Moving on, uh, Julie Delph. Thank um, In Ms. Hoxie's letter into the Addison Independent, she stated that the Forest Service had met with the Goshen and Salisbury Select Boards to discuss this proposed project as part of the Forest Service Annual Review. I'm wondering then, since the project is in Leicester, why there has been no contact from the Forest Service, Muslim Association, or Vermont Hut Association to meet with the Leicester Select Board. I'm wondering why the only communication received by Leicester is an email received on May 26th from the Forest Service providing an invitation to comment. Why hasn't anyone asked to meet with the select board to discuss the project and the very real concerns about emergency services, access, and the possible financial implications to Leicester taxpayers. I'm also interested to know if you guys have done an emergency services assessment and included the information done by the college students that said that emergency services were at least 20 minutes away which doesn't include the time it takes for the volunteer fire departments to go and get in their trucks. So I would like to know when you guys will be coming to Leicester to discuss the project that is taking place in Leicester. Yeah, so, so that's, that's, my, that's my bad on, on the Leicester Select Board. I have a meeting to contact the Leicester Select Board to get on the agenda, and uh, it has not happened yet, but it will happen. I'll do it this up for the, probably the beginning of next week. I'll reach out to the Select Board. We have not done emergency services assessment that's not something that I, I the forest service typically does because most locations on the green mountain national forest if you're 20 minutes away you're close um but that's something we can talk about at that time when i come to the select board meeting like what's necessary there so there's significant concern regarding emergency services because as you are proposing this project in the town of leicester even though it's on state slash federal land i'm assuming that you're expecting that the leicester town fire protection agreement with the brand new fire department is what you would rely on should there be a fire at the facility or arson at the facility. 
we, we would rely on forest service and local response like as typically happens um, in, in those situations so um, I, yeah, I can't go into any more on that but we could have more of a conversation about it at the select board meeting right and is there any information on how the propane would be delivered to this hub it would I, I would just presume that it would come down from the Goshen side um, into Silver Lake because that's mostly how most of the equipment comes in because it's so hard to get up from the 53 side. On, on a truck? Yes. yes. So they're going to open the road to deliver it? There's administrative access on that road for us, Green Mountain Power. So that would be considered, that would be included in their permit would be that administrative access. Similar to what it is at Chittenden Brook in the, in the one that gated, the road is gated. But it wouldn't be public access, only administrative access. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Chris. Uh, moving on, Diane Benware. Oh, go right next to her. Hi, I happen to be the chair of the Leicester Select Board, so before I leave this evening, I want to have uh, information about our next meeting so that you can be there, because um, it's been, uh, what's the word I want? It's been uh, concerning that it should go to this limit or this length already without the town that the building is proposed to be built in that the select board is not aware of unless I read it in the newspaper. This is how I found out about the meeting um, or the proposed project by reading it in the paper because no one from any organization, Ushlamu, Hut, Forest Service, has contacted the town. And that's my biggest concern this evening, representing the town because I want to protect the town's interests. Julie has indicated that our concerns have to do with arson. We all know the Silver Lake Hotel burned to the ground. Um, there's nothing to protect this particular building from burning to the ground. So arson is something, vandalism is high up on the list um, of a concern to the select board members because we've had other construction projects in town that have been impacted by people behaving in irresponsible manner. We do not have 24-hour police coverage. Uh, when we call the state police, we hope that they can get to us, but we're often told that they have limited manpower. So again, vandalism is another concern. Uh, maintenance, once a week. If you have people in every evening, or every other evening, once a week maintenance does not seem to me that that would take care of the situation, and you're gonna have uh, someone brought up wastewater, trash, etc., that will need to be handled in another fashion. Um, who ensures this particular structure? That's a question we have because uh, it's certainly not the town's responsibility. Um, and we'd like to know if there is a fire in the Green Mountain National Forest, who pays for that? If it's if it's on Lester, within the Lester environs, if you want to call it that, are we responsible for that? We have a contract with the town of Brandon to provide our fire coverage. It seems to me that um, the Brandon Fire Department would be an important stakeholder to have at a meeting such as this because uh, it's, as Julie pointed out, it's a minimum of 20 minutes from leaving the station to getting to even probably close to Silver Lake, not allowing for the men who are, or the volunteers to get to the station, etc. Um, and they, I don't know what kind of equipment they would need to take in with them, but I don't know if the fire department has that kind of um, capability. So, uh, again, I, my concern is to protect the interests of the town, and I've probably not covered all of the things that might be a liability, but that would be something further to discuss is what other unintended consequences could impact the town based on this particular project. Thank you, Diane. Um, responses? Come on up, take the mic. Uh, for insurance, we insure the Hut for Liability and Property Insurance, not Huts Association. Uh, as far as uh, wastewater, someone asked earlier as well, I did get a chance to address that. What, what do um, guests do with the, the water? It's uh, the same best management practices that are executed at uh, the campgrounds. So guests disperse of their, and you brush your teeth, they disperse it in the surrounding area, just like you do when you're camping. There is, again, no running water in the hut. Thank you, RJ. Uh, moving on, Jim Leary. Did not want to speak. All right. Moving on. Michael Brown? 
Michael Brown. McNeil Brown? How about Mimi Brown? Mimi, okay. You're here, Frank. Mimi, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have brought them. Yes, she should have. Can everybody hear me with a mask on? Oh. Sorry. I'm Amy Brown. Um, my husband ran Bradbury State Park for 16 years from the mid-70s to 1991. I was park naturalist at Bradbury, led many a hike to Silver Lake. Um, Year-round, know what all the, the um, environment is up there and what a, what a gem it is. Um, some of what I've had to say is, has been slightly addressed, but I would like to fine tune it a little bit more. Um, as Galena said, Silver Lake falls within a roaded natural area of the National Forest, which is defined in the Recreational Opportunity Spectrum, abbreviation of ROS. Um, it is a downloadable document on the Forest Service website if you would like to read it. It's been in effect since the mid-70s and is still used for planning. Um, One of the points that's brought out is that the premise of activity, what are you going to do at a given spot, what is the setting, equals your experience. And just take in mind what you all think about what your true experience is when you go to Silver Lake. The setting you provide um, gives the influence of the types of experience and ultimately benefits the visitors that go to that area. The key to the visitor's enjoyment of the setting where they choose to recreate is to ensure that the features meet the expectations. Silver Lake provides an experience this, with this development negatively impact that experience. That's my question. And I, I love it that found in this document back in the 1970s that was, has still been used to this today. It says right in here, a common forest service phenomenon, dot, 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 development creep. And that is exactly what has been happening at Silver Lake over the years. Currently on their website, there are the following proposed projects. Some may already be done. Upgrade the access road from Goshen to the trailhead to accommodate vans and buses. <laughs> Proposed upgrade to the Silver Lake Trailhead adjacent to Route 53 in Salisbury, which John has referenced today, to increase parking spaces. Proposed construction and maintenance of a non-motorized recreational trail between Silver Lake and Muslimu Campground. The trail will cross lands in the town of Goshen, Salisbury, and Leicester. Bringing in more impacts, folks, to Silver Lake. Number four, Silver Lake Recreation Site Improvements. There's no description on the website what that means. I have no idea. And number five is why we're here tonight. The proposed two-story house, it is not a hut, it is a house, to be located near Silver Lake to accommodate up to 10 people. These five projects will most likely result in more, capital letters, people going to Silver Lake. Can the area handle more human traffic? There are approximately 1,600 acres in the Muslimu National Recreation Area, and Green Mountain Forest has over 400,000 acres. I think there are other places that can be considered. <laughs> so what I'm proposing tonight, and I think this is critical for everybody in this room, no matter what side of the coin you're on, it is time for the Forest Service to step back and develop a long-term plan for the Silver Lake area. Yay. Bring all the sta stakeholders to the table to come up with a common vision of what Silver Lake should be. That is my comments. And I do hope that the Forest Service is using these documents. And I will say there is one page I would like to reference in this document. Collaboration on Recreation Management. It's a bunch of circles, forests, unique roles in delivering benefits, evaluate the roles of the Forest Service settings, analyze the role in regional destination area, and cooperate with recreational and tourism partners. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Take the mic. Yeah, take the mic. Just that first project that you mentioned at Silver Lake. That was something about road reconstruction. That's completely foreign to me. So I'll just maybe I can. It's on your website. Okay. Upgrade the access road from Goshen to the trailhead to accommodate vans and buses. That. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my record program like that. I have no idea what that is. Oh, we have somebody over here who's waving a hand who is wearing a light brown shirt who may know. I'll email you after this for tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I'll send you that. Okay, so, so, so I, I, I'll, tra I'll translate. So he said that he would send the information. So she, was, she had asked questions about the, the road. Chris didn't know about it. Um, she said it's on the website. He said he wanted to email her to find out more about maybe where it is on the website or those kinds of things. That's what happened. And sure, uh, the name of that document, uh, Mimi, that you were referencing. It's Recreational Opportunity Spectrum, also known as ROS. Recreational Opportunity Spectrum ROS, which was mentioned by Galena. Were you guys talking about that, or were you talking about where the shows the road improvement. Is that the document you were talking about? Does that have a name for that? The National Forest, the Green Mountain National Forest website. So far, so far. What's that, right? What the projects that are currently going on in, in this area in the National Forest. Okay. All right. So. I believe Vivi is referencing the schedule of proposed actions. Schedule of proposed actions is the document that Mimi's referring to that has the bus thing and everything else you've listed. So that you've already put on the table. So we should all know what's going on. And I think the cumulative effect of all these projects is going to be enormous on the area. Okay. So, got some homework to do. All right, moving on. So I have, let's see, Jim Leary, but I don't like, Roy Newton, Roy Newton. Good evening, everyone. My name is Roy Newton. I live in Castleton, Vermont. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I may go over five minutes, so bear with me. <laughs> First of let, all, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let, 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 let's have an agreement. Let me You're not going to go over five minutes. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> I'll try not to. Uh, Here's let, your me, try. let me introduce Here's myself. I am the founder of the Vermont Ski Museum, which was started out back here in Brandon. And I went all over the state. I collected over 400 items for the Ski Museum of Historical Nature. I want to tell you right now, I'm here to tell you to save Silver Lake. Silver Lake is a tiny, tiny lake. That has been not expressed here tonight but it is a very, very tiny lake. And it cannot have any development whatsoever. And as far as a, a planning update goes, the only plan you need is to do nothing to it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Why well, I may go over five minutes, I'll tell you. Back in the 1960s, okay, they wanted to, and it was actually the National Forest wanted to put, I don't know how many campsites in there. I think it was up to 30 or something. And they wanted to put in an uh, amphitheater. I was working at Simmons at the time, and, and there's a bunch of us, and we were all working on the Apollo project. And there's a lot of fishermen from Simmons and Middlebury and everything else. I was the advisor to the Middlebury Explorer Scouts, affiliated with the uh, fire department in Middlebury. And they always used to go up there to camp overnight, okay? We didn't need a hut. You know, people took their tents, and they had a good time, and they left, and they picked everything up. So we had this, we had meetings like this, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them, I don't know how many we had. We had a bunch of them. And we had signatures in the thousand to not allow the Forest Service to do anything at all to Silver Lake. And they said to me, they said, oh, well, we have all these vehicles that come in all the time. And it's raising, yes. raising hell with the area, you know, too much. And so, 
we said to them, this is the committee of myself and several others and all, all people. This is what we said to them. Do not allow any vehicles into that camp area. And we said, make a parking lot somewhere down away from Silver Lake. And that's in 1965, 1966. That's when that parking lot was established. And it worked well. It allowed people in there. And uh, those who wanted to, to uh, hike in there and those who wanted to use that place. You put a, a hut in there now for 10 people, and you're going to, before you know it, you're going to have five huts. Thank you very much. I didn't go over you did a fantastic job. First of all, give it up for him for not going over five minutes. That was amazing. And thank you, Roy. Uh, Bruce. Bruce Atrevati, I live in Salisbury. Uh, formerly was on the Moose Lawn Association board. And I am really excited about this project. I think it's a good thing for the National Recreation Area, a good thing for the community, and a good thing for Vermont. The, uh, the HUD is not adversely going to affect the uh, area. It's set back on the other side of the Lester Hollow Trail. It's not visible from the lake. If you would just go up to the, take a drive to the uh, Chittenden Brook Shelter, and that's it's kind of remote road going up there, and that's only open in the, uh, well, from May to October, I guess, November. It's beautiful. And it's embedded in the campground. And the reason they put sight of this here, because this has facilities, this, there's a, uh, uh, as, Somebody had a question about wastewater. Wastewater is not going to go into Silver Lake. It's recycled. Uh, same thing up at, at the Chittenden River Reservoir. And it's very close to the portalettes nearby. It's accessible. Um, I'm not quite sure about the handicap accessible feature of it because there, there are um, mountain bikes and um, conveyances, I guess, that can take people to uh, to these shelters, and uh, but nobody is going to be driving down to the shelter. Uh, unlike the uh, Chittenden Brook shelter, you've got to come down from Silver Lake Trailhead, or you've got to go and come up from Falls Alana. You're only talking about like five, six months out of the year where people are going to be hiking down from there. In the winter, the Silver Lake Road is unplowed; it's closed. You could ski in. I envision that people could come off the Long Trail. You could take the Chittenden Brook shelter and you could hike from there to this shelter, which would be fabulous. And the idea is to try to have a network of these to run the entire length of Vermont. And this is a national recreation. It's not a wilderness area. It's a big misconception here. In 2006, the, uh, uh, the Wilderness Act uh, included the Moose the National Recreation Area. And it's for all people. It's not just for those people live in the area. I understand the concern that people have. They love Silver Lake. I love Silver Lake. It's not going to adversely affect the area at all. It's going to be beautiful. And I think you should look at that and uh, go to the Chittenden Book Shelter, go to their website, see what they're doing, and you'll see that this is not going to hurt anybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Next up, Amy Ryan. Amy Ryan. Salisbury and I own property in Leicester um, and I, I just wanted to speak I have used huts like this before I'm a hiker I'm a cyclist I'm a mountain biker uh, maybe an outdoor enthusiast it's probably safe to say um, I would never camp in a tent it's off limits for me but the idea of a hut is an inviting and exciting opportunity that I can take advantage advantage of. My husband and I and some friends drove to Maine a few years ago to do a snowshoe hut to hut. They have a great little uh, trail system, not unlike the distance from the Silver Lake parking lot on 53 up to this area that they're talking about. Um, it, there wasn't enough snow to actually snowshoe, but those trails are also only accessible uh, by foot. 
uh, or the um, people that manage those huts use snow machines or four-wheelers on certain access roads. Um, I will say they were extremely well managed. The huts there are, are much bigger. There are central locations where they have a kitchen, uh, family style seating, a living room where they have games and a fireplace and or a wood stove. Uh, they're staffed with people that are cooking you food, which by the way was amazing. <clears throat> um, and then the separate sleeping huts, which the ones we stayed at probably, if I had to guess, um, each unit slept about four people and there might have been eight to ten little tiny uh, units. Um, I think from a recreational opportunity, it's a no-brainer. I, I don't think there will be a negative impact on the, I spent a lot of time in the Moose Lou area, both on foot and on wheels. Um, and I, I do not run into a great number of people. I think the through hiking aspect of it provides a lot of opportunity. Um, I'm a business owner and I've listened to, to people in meetings and and the opposition and the not in my backyard put it somewhere else I think is an out of date uh, concept and way to think about things and I also think we need to think about the economic impact that something like this may have on our surrounding communities. Amy, we, yep. I'm sorry to be told you have time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Amy. Uh, next up, we have. I asked someone else to read this. Somebody from Salisbury. Last name begins with a Q. Well, that's me. Is it? No, no, no. Uh, Candon Quackland from Salisbury. Does this sound familiar? But can you read it again? Because obviously, I read Mimi and it's Michael, so I just want to make sure that. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Gordon Quackland. Well, know that you've been called. If you're from Salisbury and your last name begins with a Q. All right, moving on. Debbie Wing. Thank you. Um, my name is Debbie Wing. As you mentioned, I live in Leicester. Um, my family has lived in this area for uh, many generations and my Mother's family home is actually at the end of uh, what's well, the Churchill House Inn was my was my mother's family's home where I spent many years as a child. So we hiked into Silver Lake from the Leicester Hollow Road primarily. Now I live in Leicester, um, and I spend a lot of time in that area, both um, uh, hiking winter and summer. I do want to say with apologies to Angelo, if this was in the Addison Independent, I did not know anything about this until I received an email from someone who was opposed to the project. Um, that was the first thing, that was the first thing I heard about it and I shared it with, with my neighbors and people that I knew. Um, I have no, I have no questions and I find no fault with the idea of cabins and um, uh, into you know, hiking from cabin to cabin to cabin. I do have an issue with um, this this at Silver Lake. I think that I, I really I agree. I think it's a I think it's a gem. I I don't think I think everyone should have access, but I think the access should be limited. I think we really have to pay attention to the sensitivity of this beautiful gift of an area. Um, I. I do not think that the area is underrepresented. Underrepresented. Uh, represented. I agree with Don Brush. Um, over the last several years, I've I've noted um, cars parking on not only in the Silver Lake parking lot on Route 53, but along both sides of the road. I mean, it is really. There are times when it is really packed in there and really overcrowded. And I I think. I was disappointed to see the expansion of the parking lot. I think that just it increases the numbers of people that are there at the same time. Um, I, I like the idea of a hut, but I think this is the wrong place. I think there are lots of places, lots of camping areas that are underutilized in the state of Vermont, maybe the Moose area. 
And I think there are plenty of places that are closer to the long trail for people that are hiking the long trail that they could access. I think there are other campgrounds that are not as environmentally sensitive. Um, so with that, I am opposed to this particular hut. And I will say one more thing, and I, I don't have all of the details of this, but I remember, and I'm sure there are other people in this room that remember this, and this could have been 25 or 30 years ago when I was doing a lot of cross-country skiing between um, Blueberry Hill Inn and Churchill House Inn. And it was during the Reagan administration, and I don't know how much the Forest Service had to do with this, but they, they built a two-lane road. I won't call it a highway because it was dirt, but they built a two-lane road through that part of National Forest to, so that um, tractor-trailer trucks could go in and log in there. And I was, I was just appalled. I mean, it was an area that I had hiked and skied in, and, and I, I couldn't believe that they had opened it up literally so that these tractor trailers could go in both directions. So beware and pay attention of this sort of creeping activity. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, next up, Vicki DeZorda. Vicki DeZorda? You can stand back there. Just make sure the mic's on. I'm going to start by reading a letter of a person who wasn't able to come tonight because they live out of state. She wrote, I have been working in the field of education of people with disabilities for years. It takes more than putting a ramp for a house to be suitable for people with disabilities. I have become suspicious regarding building plans that express a goal to increase access to people with disabilities if a number of things are not in place, including at the very least paved roads, handicap accessible parking, and other appropriate handicap accessible features. What is of paramount importance is that people sensitive to the needs of the underserved population as well as people with disabilities themselves are involved in the planning processes. As I look at the plans to build a house on Silver Lake, I see nothing that makes me believe there is a sincere interest in serving people with disabilities. As you can imagine, I became outraged when it is suggested that serving people with disabilities is a reason for funding an enterprise when no true attempts to serve this population appear to be in place. Jennifer Harford, Somerset, New Jersey. I would also like to remind people that not all disabilities are physical. As one who falls into this category, physical activity and communing with nature are essential elements of my self-care practice. The hike from Route 53 to Silver Lake is the only hike I dare to make by myself, and normally only midweek to avoid the large number of people who use the area already on weekends. Making Silver Lake accessible to an even larger population would be a detriment to me personally, one who already knows and uses Silver Lake. To say that this house will be to serve the underrepresented which means me, because uh, being disabled also makes you low income, is a bit of a farce. At $165 a night, this is not something I, an actual member of the underrepresented, can afford. On my income, I cannot and will not even pay $165 a night to stay in a hotel room with running water, electricity, and a television. I'm forced to look for cheap hotels and pay for and pray for the best, that there aren't any cockroaches or unsavory characters and that it's in a safe location. Personally, <laughs> I find it offensive that others are being misled to believe that this building is being built for people like me. If 
people can't even afford to pay $30 for a tent that will last for years. What in the heck makes you think that they can afford $165 a night? You should be ashamed. I'm sorry. That's all for me. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, oh, just keep it back there, Elaine. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry, sorry. RJ is going to speak and uh, as a response to to Vicky, and then it'll be Elaine's turn. Thanks for your comments. Um, the hut price ranges from sixty-five to one hundred and sixty-five dollars based on season, seasonality, and whether it's a weekday or a weekend. That's for the entire use of the structure. It's not per person, so I want to just clarify that. You, you were it was accurate that it was um, as expensive as one hundred sixty-five dollars uh, on a winter weekend evening for the entire hut. Um, generally, the um, users that rent these um, will then gather uh, friends and/or family to split that cost. Um, so it, it, it is split among the other users. Um, as far as accessibility goes, I'll, I'll just reiterate again. Um, there are new modes of access with reclined bicycles that adaptive uh, riders have used to access a number of Vermont's trail networks, and they can utilize the existing um, access road to come down from the uh, Silver Lake East lot. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, RJ. And you bring that back to Elaine. No. Well, I know you're loud enough, but we need a microphone. Oh, you, oh, you don't want to speak? No, I don't need to oh, oh, speak. Okay. I'm just going to say. Oh, no, but just so we can pick up for the recording, that's all. That's the only reason why. It's not that you're not loud. Yeah, it's true. It's true. We, you got a great voice, <laughs> but we just need to hear it for the okay. recording. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. All I want to say is I live in Goshen. And I don't understand why not Moose Malou. It has all the perfect situation for the hut. It has accessibility, it has roads, even for people that are handicapped and so forth. Parking, they can put in a parking area. So I don't understand why they want to take a pristine place like Silver Lake or even concept of the Goshen Dam too. That is insane. I can't believe that they want to tamper with Silver Lake or Goshen Dam when they already have got enough all accessibility at Moose Moon. That's my only really, you know, thing I want to say. Thank you, Elaine. Does anybody want to address that question, Chris, RJ? Question was why Silver Lake as opposed to Moose Moon, where, where is access? from the report, from the scouting report by the Musulamu uh, Association members who went to three sites in September 2021, looked at the Musulamu site, and the conclusion was, and I quote, I remember that, uh, they, it doesn't, it didn't feel right in our minds. That's the exact wording from that report. Angelo, R.J. Thompson, and Dave Savatini signed it. And later, a paragraph later, it says, uh, Muslim site is not a showstopper, but it pales in comparison to Silver Lake. That's the actual answer. And I'm very happy to provide this report to everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you for providing the answer for that. Moving on to Mary Lord. I've been a semi-outdoors person. I mean, I don't work, I, I, I have one. Can you put the microphone? How's that? Is that better? Perfect. Okay. I do have some concerns about this, and I would like to preface this with back in the 90s, I went, when I was with the Brandon Historical Society, we made a pamphlet in, in cooperation with the Forest Service about Silver Lake. We used Fred Putnam, who was, was the ranger then, and it, it was a great experience. We wrote it. <coughs> I'm trying to read this, and I wrote it in, in low light, so go bear with me. Um, we, in that pamphlet, we, we um, described a trail that we had made around Silver Lake. 
We talked about the history of Silver Lake. We, did, we talked about the geology of Silver Lake. We talked about the native people that lived on Silver Lake. We talked about the flora and the fauna. This place is a really special little lake. I do have some, um, oh, and at that time we were told by the Forest Service that Silver Lake was a primitive, a primitive des destination. And that is why there were just the campsites as they were. There weren't huts. Apparently, primitive is, change, is a word that's changing. Um, I do have some concerns about full disclosure of the financial arrangement between the Forest Service and the Muslim Association and the Vermont Hut people. I don't think that's been described anywhere that I've been able to read. And, sorry. and I do, I am worried about the historical part of Silver Lake and the impact that a building that sleeps 10, 10 people will have. We know there were Native people in that area for many, many years. There are artifacts that came out of that lake that, that were impressive in the in how old they were. And I have not seen or heard how, how this area will be protected, at least from a historical standpoint. And those are just some of my concerns. Thank you, Ray. Chris, you want to address? Yeah. Yeah. So our, from the, for your last point, um, our, our forest archeologist is gonna do, a, do some shovel test pits in the location uh, where the hut is proposed to go to ensure that we're not disturbing any pre-contact sites or any historical sites. And if they find something there, that would be a cause for us to kind of have to fall back, regroup, look at look at a different location, something like that. That would put a that would put a stop around that particular site. Um, the financial question, the financial relationship between Muslim Association, Vermont Huts, and and the Forest Service. There, there really isn't a financial relationship. Um, we do provide money to both organizations through um, agreements um, where they agree to do work on the National Forest to forward Forest Service goals and objectives um, so that we get a kind of a goods for services relationship. Um, and then um, Vermont Hunts Association through their special use permit for the Chittenden Brook Hut um, pays a fee every year based on the amount of usage and income that they make and that money comes back to the the U.S. Treasury. So that's the only kind of relation, financial relationship that we have. There's no like giving, giving Vermont Huts money to just give Vermont Huts money. There's always work that has to be accomplished related to that to help us achieve goals and objectives. I don't know if you're doing. I see. You just you have a thing you have one to follow up. Well, I, I just, it would have been nice if that was made clear early on in this whole process. And for the for the recording, it would have been nice if it had been made clear earlier on in the process. Is what Gary said. And you, oh, no, you take it. That's right. You can travel with it. Kathy, you've been patient. It's now your time. Kathy Mathis, everybody. Um, I totally agree with the Lester contingent, Diane and Julie. Great concerns regarding the fire response. Uh, for Lester, I live in Goshen, and we have the same exact concerns um, if there should be a fight. 20 minutes, we rely on Brandon as well. And um, the question that I had for uh, Angelo when you said something about the Musulu parking, is that because of in the winter there's no plowing done down there, or is it? What is the reasoning? That's you said Musulu was unacceptable because of. Right now, there's no existing can you come up, parking can, notes. Come on over just so we can hear it on the mic. I'm sorry. There's just no existing parking right now, is all I was saying. You, you could build something out there, but it's just not there. Okay. Okay, then why don't you build it? Well, that's good. You know? That's good. Um, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Now I'm doing Bill too. Okay, all right. She's, she's taking Bill's time. Bill wrote down some questions for me. 
Okay, this is um, who profits from the hunt? As presented, the National Forest and the Muslim Association would reap the financial benefits. Who controls the land in Goshen, where I live? The Forest Service primarily estimated 60 to 70 percent of the land in Goshen. What percent of the town cannot be taxed? The National Forest part, 60 or 70 percent. Does the government provide payment in lieu of taxes? Yes. $15 per thousand for FY23, $15. Uh, what's that as a percent of costs? The Warren Town budget was 235,000 for FY22. So the income is 6.4% of the town costs. Is this fair and reasonable? No, it's not. It takes away the local tax base and the town suffers the resuiting inequity. This is below what most people would consider reasonable. Silver Lake is in Leicester, not Goshen. True. However, the main access route is on the Goshen roads, which subjects the roads to excessive battering, partying, vandalism, scenic degradation, and the like. The roads are terrible to begin with. And in this to it is like pouring fuel on fire. Who are the Muslim benefactors, supporters, and friends? As a group, they are non-Goshen planning groups, hotels, hospitality organizations, and the like. Surprisingly, Blueberry Hill is not listed. As a group, they stand to profit from the hut while not having any known or evident financial responsibility. Doesn't this place an inequitable tax burden on the town? The per capita income for the town was $17,031. The state per capita is $30,740. The people of Goshen have chosen to live in an environment that is pristine. They have paid a price to enjoy a measure of solitude and tranquility, but the economic benefits go to others. This is out of balance. By this argument, reparations would be due. What would be reasonable? While the question deserves broader input, a reasonable and logical reparation might be an ongoing subsidy for the paving and the maintenance of the roads. Whose benefit would be enjoyed by residents, tourists, nature enthusiasts, enthusiasts, and governments. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, Mason, Mason Wade. Back these back there. The mic is on its way to you. Association. 
these characters, wonderful people, but as an organization, they've learned tricks of the trade and language skills that are allowing them to take over the state from the voters. Look at it hard. Belmont is a trail that's for mountain bikes from uh, Massachusetts to the Canadian border. Well, what did we do in the 30s with the Green Mountain Parkway? First, the profiteers came in, not the non-profit profiteers, but the profiteers came in and convinced the legislators that we needed a highway on top of the Green Mountains. For what purpose? Progress, tourism, you name it. <laughs> it goes on. But who stopped the Green Mountain Parkway? The voters did. They, they said, no way. And the towns of Vermont said, that ain't going to happen. And we all know, you won't be able to appreciate it until it's gone. And when you're talking to your neighbors, everything, this is not just about Silver Lake. Please wake up and see what's going on statewide with how well nonprofit has corrupted our state. Thank you. Thank you, Mason Wade. Uh, next up, we're on to the second page, guys. Tabori Brule. My name is Tabori Brule, and I oppose this project. In fact, I was horrified when I heard about it. I'm a little more disappointed when I get here tonight, and I see that Angela Lynn is part of this, because normally I, I quite a bit respect Angela, but um, this is a bad idea. The if, if we look back for 50 years, um, 50 years ago it was in vogue to develop national parks, to develop state parks, to build hotels, to build gas stations, to build stores, um, to build amphitheaters, and Roy referred to this and what he was talking about. Um, and then along with that development in our parks came wastewater, wastewater treatment plants and small power stations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Today, the, the trend is in the other direction, thankfully. Um, but what we see here is a hearkening to the past going the wrong way. So um, I think this project is on the wrong side of history. Um, and I think we need uh, to keep our wild spaces wild. Um, I'm a little concerned that, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm a little concerned that the Forest Service does not seem to be a neutral player here tonight. Um, I, I, I fully understand the HUD Association. They seem like good people. Um, they're trying to do this thing. Um, but the Forest Service should be a neutral arbiter here. Um, the preponderance of public opinion um, seems to be decidedly against this project. Um, so I would just hope that they listen to that. Um, I, I'm not sure where this is going to go. Um, and to close, I would just like to adamantly disagree with the previous speaker. Uh, there is nothing beautiful about a house at Silver Lake. Um, or in my opinion, at Moose Maloon. We, we don't need this in either place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tabori. So I, I just want to assure you that the Forest Service is a, a neutral party in this. It may not appear so. Because we've accepted the we, we, no, no, no. Oh, guys, guys, I mean, this is just, let me speak, please. I've listened very patiently and calmly to you. I just, we are a neutral party in this. It seems like we're not because we've accepted their proposal and we've done part of the resource analysis already, so I know certain things already. I know that there's no concern from some resources. So when, when I was asked early on um, by Mrs. Stewart, about um, extraordinary circumstances, we know that some of those extraordinary circumstances were not in violation of those extraordinary circumstances. That makes, may make it appear like we're not a neutral party, but we are a neutral party. And there are comments on both sides of this, and I'm lis listening to and balancing all of those comments, and that's what will help make the decision in the end. Thank you. Chris? RJ? From the HUD Association? Like that. Anna? Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to mention that this, this is exactly that, an info session, and we, we, we really did want to listen to everyone here, and we recognize the fact that there, there, would, there would be and is opposition to this project. To, to keep it um, 
cordial and, and respectful. We intentionally did not, this is mostly for the folks online who think we're taking a bruising here. <laughs> we intentionally did not like rally our troops. We really just wanted to hear from folks who had their concerns. And so if it feels lopsided here, that's the reality of tonight. But we do have a lot of folks who actually support this type of work, this meaningful work. So I just want to put that out there on the public record. It's not this type of work. Thank you, RJ. So, Leonard Waltrip. Every summer, the first few years I was there, there was an Abenaki shaman who would come up the lake and stand on the dam and put floods to the lake. Uh, but now it's, it's going, it's, I want to talk about the road in the winter. As it came, in the last quarter mile of that road, it's not plowed in the winter. How cars are going to park there or be abandoned there? And the neighbors are going to have a complaint. And uh, there's a lot more to say, but I'm not a public speaker. speaker. And uh, that's, that's about what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Orbit. Over to Mike Keegan. All right. Glenn Walter. I'm all set. Okay. All right. And Andy McIntosh. Hi, I'm Andy McIntosh. Uh, I'm the Catamount Trail Trail Chief for Section 15 and also 16 in Drifton. And uh, I had a couple questions about winter access for the uh, um, uh, to the hut. Um, and maybe you guys can answer that right now. Um, from the Catamount Trail, and, and, and I'm a strong supporter of the hut system. I think Catamount Trail skiers would truly benefit from uh, more huts in Vermont. Uh, and, uh, but, but from the Catamount Trail, it looked to me about three miles of uh, uh, ski into and I'm not sure what the route would be. Um, it would be shared by a snowmobile trail, following the snowmobile trail into Silver Lake, or how you would you would actually get there from the Catamount Trail. Can you guys answer that right now? Question about the route from the Catamount Trail. Yeah, I think Andy hit the nail on the head. It would be the easiest route would be to follow the snowmobile trail from the Catamount Trail down. That would be the easiest access from Catamount. You, yeah, I mean, you could. There was a question about you know parking on the the road down to Silver Lake. Some people may choose to ski there, but the parking would become an issue there. It would have to be addressed at some point. Like winter winter parking there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think uh, you know that's I've skied on that snowmobile trail and I had to jump off the trail uh, to avoid getting run over. It would be it'd be a benefit if the, if the uh, snowmobile trail was widened a little bit because there's some turns on that that you better be listening and when you hear them you jump off the trail because they fly right through there. Um, I think it's a, it's a tough access. Uh, I think you guys mentioned um, three other sites, uh, top of Brooks Road, um, uh, Sugar Hill Reservoir or Goshen Dam area, and, and the Moose, or the Moose Lamu Campground. All of those would be much more accessible to Catamount Trail skiers, uh, I, I believe, and, and should, be, should be reconsidered 
over the Silver Lake option. It, it just there's just not a lot of skiers in that in that area. Um, so um, unless you're, um, I, I think it would just just be better utilized by skiers if we could get a little closer to the Catamount Trail. So um, strong supporter of of the huts. I think it's a great idea. I would agree that also that most of the Musalamu is underutilized. All of the, I, I'm out there weekly skiing, mountain biking. I backpack through the Musalamu. I'm out there all the time. And I don't see anybody anywhere else. But Silver Lake, I wouldn't agree, is, is uh, uh, underutilized. Everywhere else in the, in the Musalamu, it'd be nice to get some more use out there in, in those other parts, of, other beautiful parts of Musalamu. And, uh, but Silver Lake is not the place to do that. And just, just from a I'm not representing the Catamount Trail Association with this, but it, it would be really nice to have a little bit more of a connection to the hot system via the Catamount Trail than, than where you've located it right now. So, so okay. Thank you. Next up we have Judy Kowalczyk. Judy Kowalczyk. Judy K from uh, from Ripton, going once. She must have left. All right, moving on. Oh, this guy's here. Jim Hayes from Goshen. Did you want to speak, Jim? Jimmy, did you want to say? <laughs> Jim Hayes. Uh, thank you. I'm Jim Hayes, uh, road road foreman of Tara Goshen, and. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about the um, possibility of more traffic, and uh, we don't have very much of a budget uh, in the town of Ocean, so uh, I'm kind of concerned that be, there might be more traffic uh, on the roads. And uh, I used to go up there back when I was a kid. Uh, that would be back in the 1940s. Um, and it was uh, wide open then. Everybody, everybody could come in, uh, cars, trucks, motorcycles, and it was just a, not a very nice place, actually, it was trash all over the place. And then, uh, and then they uh, put in the parking lots and you had to hike in. And it became a beautiful place, uh, some place where I, I just love to go to. And, um, and I think it's, uh, the hut should be uh, um, put somewhere out, somewhere where with better access. Uh, I'm 80 years old. I can still hike into the into the uh, Silver Lake area, and no problem. And I think maybe when I get 90, I'll still be hiking here. Uh, but um, I have to agree, the handicapped people. Uh, it, you know, they, they can't experience uh, so like, uh, like we do. Um, and that, that is a concern. But I, I think um, there's other areas that are just as beautiful and you can, and are access, you can access them uh, uh, with, with vehicles. And, uh, and so the handicap can find other alternate places to go. I, that's my opinion. Anyway, so I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Hayes. Marie, did you want to speak? Marie Hayes, you were last on this list. Did you want to speak, Marie? No, you put your name down. Oh, Jim. Uh, oh, I have somebody here. Can you try to read this? Somebody from Middlebury? Oh, Gary Baker. Gary Baker. Gary Baker. Hi, Gary. Hi. Yeah. Hear me? Okay, I'm in pretty much agree. I'm not in favor of this going in at Silver Lake. I think a great place for it would be a Musselboe campground where you've got all the facilities already made, except for a parking lot. I'm concerned about the wildlife in Silver Lake, particularly the loons. And I, I'm not a wildlife biologist, but I suspect it's a great deer yard because it's, it's a basin, it's protected from the wind, and it's full of oak trees and acres. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Ken Titchuk. 
Ken, Ken did you? Did you? Did you? Okay. Say your name just so I can satisfy my... My name is Ken. I'm not sure what I'm going to say. I was even going to put my timer up, but um, I, I think I came here in opposition um, initially because the first I really learned any details was the letter to the editor, Yaddy Indy. I guess that was last week. And I thought it was like Club Med coming in, and I thought, holy macro. I'm here because, and probably like every single person in the room, professional or, or residents, I adore Silver Lake. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a brand newcomer to Vermont. I don't, you know, I don't belong here with all you Vermonters because I've only been here 16 years. And <laughs> only 16 years. But in those years, I've been up there a few hundred, I was trying to calculate, a few hundred times. And when we had, I had guests from all around the world, um, both my professional life and my family, they always go up to Silver Lake, that's where they, maybe because when I give them their options, you could go to freaking Ben and Jerry's, or I could take you to Silver Lake, <laughs> the greatest spot on the planet. Um, and I take them up there all the time. Um, I like you, I hate when I go there and that parking lot is full and overflowing and stuff. But then I always remind myself that, um, that that's because I live here and I think Silver Lake belongs to me. And I want it to be just the way it is. I, like when I go there on a Wednesday in the wintertime and there's nobody around. Um, and I've, over the years I've come to believe that the coolest thing about Silver Lake, not, not only accessible in the handicap sense, I mean it's a place that a lot of people know about hiking, they know about the Green Mountains, and that's where they go to experience it. Lots of people do that. So when I pull up to that freaking parking lot and I hate it, I try to remember I don't own this place. Just because I live here, I don't own this place. And other people can come here. It's great that people who are 70 or 80, I'm 70 or 90, think they can go up there and sleep in a tent. That's great, but that's us. Um, my wife can't anymore, and the only way I'd ever get her to camp with me up at Silver Lake is in a place like this, and when we have guests and family. Um, I, I hike all over the place. Um, um, I don't know how many thousand, my, and I've been in huts in other states, and I've always been grateful to the people who put them there, and I've always been grateful that they're maintained and people respect them and it's cool and it's wonderful. It never occurred to me that I had to be grateful that nobody opposed these things. Um, so after reading about the Club Med in the Annie Indy, I saw this fact sheet and I thought, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Um, it, and I really asked, I have to look in the mirror when I go home. Like I said, I came here to oppose, but I'm going to go look in the mirror and say, is this a case of NIMBY? Is this, I could, this could be anywhere but not here. This is the, and, and is it also, there's a thing called first settler complex. Because I'm here now and it's pristine, that's the way it ought to stay forever. Um, <laughs> But that's not fair. That's not fair. What about the person who wants to come tomorrow? Why do they have they less rights than us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So he's I don't got want to argue with you. He's, he's, got, he's got a minute 20. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm just saying I, I hope I'm going to look in the mirror and say, just because you know, other people have the right to access that place. and and. And also, in all the times I've been up there, the beauty is wonderful and stuff. I've met some amazing people there, just amazing people who wouldn't see hiking anywhere else in the Green Mountains, but I see them there, just cool people. And um, so I, it just seems to me to be um, a classic case of NIMBY and First Settler Complex. And I feel awfully selfish if I can't, if I continued my opposition. So, to, and, and what I've heard in opposition tonight was primarily NIMBY and first settlement complex. 
I've heard arguments just thrown up to make arguments. 30 on, seconds. On both sides of the issue. You know, it's too accessible, it's not accessible enough. It's this, it's that, it's the next thing. Um, I just say we all ought to look in the mirror and think, are you kidding me? This is a really simple, nice, good thing for the area. And, and um, so, thanks. Thanks for hearing me. May I ask uh, where? Thank you. Oh, I, live in, uh, I live in Salisbury. I'm about a five minute drive from, and like I said, I'm up there at least once a week all year round. So, I, and, and it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter, I don't think. Uh, thank you, Ken. All right, sure. Thank you very much. All right. Ken, thank you. Uh, Michelle Fay. Michelle Fay. since I'm here. Um, I guess I'm just going to ask one simple question. Just repeat your name. Michelle Fay. Michelle Fay. Ripton. Uh, since I've, ha I've been hearing that a few people say there's really no problem with this, there's not going to be an impact. Um, my question to you is what kind of an environmental impact assessment will be happening? What kind of an environmental impact assessment will be happening? So, so the analysis that's being done is called an analysis of categorically excluded projects. It meets a number of categories that don't rise to the level on the surface of an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement. If somewhere along the analysis that we, we find something that does make it rise to that, we can shift gears on the analysis. But right now it's a categorically excluded project because it meets a couple of categories. One is the issuance of a special use permit, um, construction and reconstruction of trails, and then construction and rec construction, reconstruction of recreation facilities at an already developed site. There's certainly a campground. Yes. And who's doing? Oh, Mike's off. Yeah, I think I pushed it before I gave it to you. Sabotage. Am I on? No. We're supposed to know how to use a microphone. First time I'm microphone. Just kidding. Okay. Um, and who is doing this assessment? The, the Forest Service is doing this assessment. It's part of our National Environmental Policy Act review. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, thank you. Uh, cool. Clark Goshen. First name scratched out. Oh, Britta. Britta. Britta? Is Britta still here? No. All right, how about Sherry? Sherry, how's Goshen? Negative, all right. Carly from Goshen? Carly, okay, no, there's no last name. I, was I read it correctly, which I'm excited about. All right, so I'm really nervous to do public speaking. Sure. You can stand where you want. With the mic, will pick you up. Yeah, so anyway, I'm here mostly because um, I have been here yeah, I feel like Goshen is my hometown, so I just feel that I'm also not against huts. I use Catamount, I use Long Trail on the outside, but I definitely feel that Vermont's outdoor community isn't inclusive, isn't um, doing enough for racial equity, isn't doing enough for disabled people, isn't doing enough. And I also feel um, that, I, well, I also feel that maybe Silver Lake isn't a good location. I am, a lot of my points that I want to bring up have already been brought up, but I also feel that there should be more of a presence um, from the Abenaki. I think there should be more of a presence from disabled community people. I think there should be more of a presence of just um, LGBTQ plus people here and involved in every part of the process. I just feel like, and also, I feel like I should state that a couple years ago, with Vermont Huts, as a public person, I tried to reserve a night and couldn't, which is fine, whatever, right? So I was like, oh, maybe a membership will actually help, because apparently it doesn't seem like you can really get a night there. So I was a member for one year. 
I had problems with that. Members get to, so I think what never got brought up tonight was their system for booking, and I don't feel like it's inclusive. And that kind of like, that idea went off when I tried as a member, and we have like a week for members to reserve, which I thought was a little excessive, but I mean, they do it in like, I think two parts, and they'll probably speak after me, but um, they do like the one half of the year all at once, and then the other half of the year all at once. And so members get first pick for a week, which I think is way too much time. And then public apparently gets picked for, I don't know, it's probably the same week, or just until everything's booked. Um, why that's problematic is because even as a member, at 12.03, I wasn't able, a lot of weekends and um, favorable nights were already reserved. So <laughs> if members, which I don't feel like you should have to be a member to stay at a hut, I don't feel like you should have to pay to have access to outside. I don't feel like you should assume that disabled communities or other kinds of communities have this gear that even allows them to access stuff. Um, there's a lot of assumptions being made. Um, but anyways, with the scheduling, even after three minutes into this whole week that members get, couldn't get a night. And I um, reached out to the Mott Huts and I was voicing this, and I didn't. And I was voicing how I didn't feel like it felt inclusive if it if everything's taken up so quickly. There's literally the no way that underserved seniors, any kind of person, any kind of community is really getting a fair stab um, at all. There's no system, and I never got a reply ever. And I thought that was interesting, especially since in all the literature it says that it's to, you know they serve seniors and underserved. Community is also, but just it clearly there's a scheduling issue. I don't think maybe even a whole season, a season should be all at once grabbed. Maybe there's like, I just feel like there needs to be more thinking involved and more input and heart and passion to our outdoor community in our whole state as a whole, not just Goshen, Western, Salisbury. Um, that's more inclusive and gives more access. And it's kind of interesting. I just, I just don't understand. It, can there be anything? that gives to the originators of our land that had to like be forced off like Abenaki. Like why are they not in, not just like the site has artifacts, but like in the whole process, they should have a voice. Um, they should be involved. There should be, and where, where is this profit, where is this, this 15,000 a year, I think was the quote for the hut? 2700 a year. A year? 2700 Yeah, so. But like, where does that go? I think in some of the reading, it was trying to make it seem like if there's an overflow or what, anything after that point goes back into the huts, or I forget how it got worded, it would probably be mentioned. But I'm just saying, I don't think there's enough being done. 30 seconds, Carly. Currently, to really be inclusive. I, it's hard for me to swallow that Vermont huts is really going to do that in this location or maybe even others. I don't know how it can even, if, if scheduling is not even addressed or other things like access and gear and all these things, you can say people have access, but they clearly don't too. So I think that should be definitely um, involved in the whole process. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. I assume that RJ is going to take the mic. Thanks for those comments. Um, you're right. It's not inclusive in Vermont in the outdoors. Um, and right before the pandemic, we started uh, a program called the Forest Program. Uh, it's an acronym for Fostering Outdoor Recreation, Econo uh, sorry, Fostering Outdoor Recreation, Education, Sustainability, and Teamwork. Um, that program was developed to meet that need. We only have 11 huts across the state, and you're right, um, members do receive a one week uh, early booking window. Any member of the general public can become a member. It's $35 for an individual. $65 for a family, that's for the entire year. Yeah, it gives you a one week early booking window. It also gives you 15% off um, all of your hut reservations for that entire year. So it pays for itself uh, very, very quickly if you use uh, any of our huts for a couple nights. Um, the, I'm sorry that no one responded to you. I can say I'm not sure how that happened because I've been uh, working at the Mott Huts and founded it since 2016. And I will look back to our correspondence if you could give me your name and see if I can dig that up. 
because we are very diligent about responding to our guests. Um, I want to speak more of the forest program inclusivity. When we started the forest program, it was right before the pandemic started. We partnered with the Addison Central Team uh, Center to bring folks uh, under uh, folks from uh, lower income families into the backcountry free of charge. It included um, gear uh, that was donated in partnership with the Catamount Trail Association. Um, if they needed backpacks, we found them backpacks. It included their meals for that weekend. It included the transportation to and from the teen center to the parking lot at Chittenden Brookhouse. Pandemic hit. We haven't been able to run it since then. We are now uh, running it again this summer and heading into you know, subsequent years for the future. Every new hut that we build will host at least four forest program weekends at those huts on an annual basis. So both in the winter and in the summer. So we are trying to fill that gap and meet that need. Um, it's something that we take seriously. We hired a development communications manager recently to address just that and run the forest program and scale it up and look into how do we meet the LGBT community, those underrepresented communities, and really bring them into the backcountry and make it, it's literally free. They do not pay anything. Um, and so I, I agree 100%. Um, the way we do that uh, and to make that available is by charging a, a fee for the structures and the membership fees and the profits as they uh, have been uh, implied do you get poured back into our organization to fulfill the mission and grow the mission and create more opportunities for access, not just for folks who are paying, but for folks who can't afford to pay. Thank you, Arjen. So, we're at a critical moment here. I have one more name on this list, and then we'll see about opening up to possible people that had an opportunity to sign on the list. Ben Rosenberry. 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 Rosenberg. <laughs> it looks like a lie, I'm telling you, but it's a G. Rosenberg, sorry, man. The doctor, you can't write. Where are you? I'm Ben Rosenberg. Uh, I'm uh, also a relative newcomer to the state. Uh, we moved here in 93. Uh, the first place that my wife and I came when we came, visited Middlebury to see if we are going to like moving here was Silver Lake. We hiked up Fazalana, we went up to Silver Lake, Silver Lake, and we subsequently come up there scores, if not hundreds of times. We raised our three daughters here. They know the place inside and out. Anytime anybody has ever come visit us here, we bring up to Silver Lake. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, I'm just going to tell a quick story uh, about Silver Lake, and I hope it eliminates uh, some of the discussion here. Uh, first, I want to say that um, I, I always say that the root of all evil is bad communication, and good communication leads to understanding. And I want to say, so I'm a member of the uh, Muslim Association Board. I want to say that I really appreciate everybody coming out and sharing their view. And if we didn't do a good enough job communicating in advance, hopefully we're trying to foster this communication. And it's, it's well heard, by the way, that we didn't do a good enough job as we could have. So thank you for making the effort tonight. Back. Back. I just wanted oh. to be added to the speaker list. Oh, okay. Sharon. Oh, no, no, see, yes. Uh, are you, but he's not a physician, but yeah, Sharon, Stearns, and I'm going to hand the sheet back to anybody else who wants to get on to. Anyway, one, one of my boyhood chums from Massachusetts um, had two wonderful daughters. Um, he was kind of a wild guy. Um, passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Uh, when his daughters were like 10 and 7, he had got this cockamamie idea to come up. He looked in, before the internet even. He looked in some book and found Silver Lake as a good place to go camping. And so he came up in the summer with his wife and the two daughters, and they all had bikes. And he had rigged up a trailer, and they parked at the Falls Alana parking and biked up with these ten and seven year old. And he, he told me he should do this. I said, Dave, hey, you're, you're nuts, man. That's a tough ride for you know, the kids and you lighting the stuff. But anyway, he came up there and did it. And they camped for three days by the big rock, that campsite in the big rock. And we went up and visited them just to say hi. And they had the most wonderful time. Um, and it was awesome. But I'll tell you that the four of them, two, ten, a 10 year old and a seven year old camping there, not like the quietest people ever. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous place to live. But it has been, and this was 
20 years ago. That, his daughter just got married. Uh, the younger daughter just got married this weekend. Uh, it's, yes, it's a pristine and beautiful place, but it is home to a lot of recreationalists. And uh, I, I too am frustrated when I see the parking lot full, but I also think that who am I or who are we all to decide who, who gets a chance to use it? It's a, it's a wonderful resource that I think it's great that people can use. And when we talk about accessibility or accessibility, how about accessibility to people who aren't going to hike the long trail? It's too hard. But they can hike up to Silver Lake. Almost anybody can do that. And, and so this just offers another uh, accessible option for people who are doing other types of recreation. By the way, I will just say that to me, it's very important to hear the input here uh, about people's feelings about the Silver Lake location for the hut. Um, and we're going to take this back and talk about it. So again, thank you for everybody for sharing their views, and I hope that uh, this has been a respectful dialogue between people who care about a wonderful place. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. All right. Next up, we have Sharon Sturridge. No, it's on right now. Okay. Hi, I'm Sharon Stearns. I'm a local accountant, an avid horseback rider and trail rider, and I spend a lot of time on the Silver Lake Trail educating people about the Morgan horse, the Vermont horse. Uh, people uh, love to see my horse. They love to see my horses. They love for me to stop and pet them. They like to talk about the history of them. They, they ask me amazing questions. And I can never say when I'm going to be home, because I never, never know. But the biggest problem is I can never find parking, because I have a 21-foot trailer behind my truck. And so I have to get up at the crack of dawn. And most of the forests are not available to me, because there's nowhere to park my rig, OK? I was on the Vermont Horse Council Board for a number of years, and I worked with the Forest Service. Uh, I joined, went on to various committees to work with the trails. And I can tell you that I'm really disappointed in the Forest Service. I'm disappointed because they give a lot of preference to these folks that do this work full time in these nonprofits that don't really look like nonprofits. <laughs> And so, and I know the numbers, and I've looked at the Vermont Huts Association tax returns for 2018, 2019, and 2020 today, and you know, they're averaging about $100,000 a year, and he's making about 39,000 as of the 2020 return. So what is happening here is our Forest Service is letting somebody run a nonprofit and make money on our forests that we own, okay? Now, I have three businesses, and I have to pay for all of the real estate. And when I'm done, I have to pay all the income taxes on that income. When I ask the Forest Service to help me get more roads and parking where I can have access, that's the answer I get. Did you hear it? It's nothing. So I'm disgusted to see this happen. I don't want to see more development at Silver Lake. I want to see a spot where their trailers can be parked. I want them to cater to the recreationalists, not the business people. I don't care what they couch it in as a nonprofit. That's the his, that's the that's the thing in Vermont we do is we just make 501c3. So I do them all the time. That's what I do. That's not okay, and it's not okay for our Forest Service to use our land. Should I be charging for riding lessons to go up the hill every day? Should I make my money there? No. I make my money on my farm, and I pay the real estate taxes, and I pay the income tax. I don't fake it as a nonprofit. I pay my taxes. So I want the Forest Service to hear me when I say that I want to use that land recreationally, and I want there to be parking. And when I go up there, I have people parked everywhere. I have to be there at 7 in the morning. And there's very few paces, and every time they make a trail, there's no parking. So I, I might say horse use, but I can't use it. So this is infuriating because, you know, Vermonters don't come to, I mean, outsiders don't come here to see Vermont to, to just see the hordes of people. They want to see horses. 
They want to see outdoors people. They don't want to see civilization. That's everywhere. So we need to fight, folks. We've got to fight this. Because if we don't fight it, then the next organization and the next one and the next one will ignore us and these folks will work full time with our forest service and they'll have businesses on our federal property, our state property. It's not okay. And we need to stand up and be prepared to fight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Cher. Um, RJ has a comment. We're a nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3 federally recognized nonprofit organization. I actually make $65,000 a year now, thank you, um, because I was given a raise for doing a really good job and bringing more folks outside. I take offense to the notion that we are a for-profit business using federal land to get rich. I'll probably be not given a raise for another 10 years, and that's fine, because I love what I do. I bring people outside. I show them the beauty of nature. I show folks who can't get outside on a regular basis new spots to explore. Horses, actually, if the trail allows for it, are very welcome <laughs> at any of our huts. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, to make accusations that an organization that is a nonprofit is somehow um, growing and getting rich off of federal lands is simply false. Ma'am, there are a number of organizations that have uh, fees for use, including the campsites themselves. Thank you, RJ. Um, thank you again, Sharon, for your comments. Um, moving on to Patrice. Oh, sorry. Chris, then Patrice. Come on down, Patrice. Yeah, we, we, have, we do have parking on the Musaloo National Recreation Area that would accommodate your trailer. Widow's Clearing would accommodate your trailer. Mini Baker would accommodate your trailer, and the changes that and the changes that we're making to the Falls of Lana parking lot will have an expanded parking lot, parallel pulling parking that would accommodate that trailer. So there is parking that will be available for your trailer. Mini Baker is not sufficient to turn that trailer around. I have to back it in from 53, so you're wrong. And just to follow up on what RJ said, um, there are any number of organizations for nonprofit and for profit who work on the National Forest. We have maple tapping permits where people get, collect sap and they pay a fee and then they sell that product. We have Camp Kuwaitin, which runs camp trips. We have endurance races. We have all sorts of organizations that work on the National Forest, both nonprofit and for-profit, and they all pay a fee for the, for the ability to run their events and have their tapping operations or whatever it may be, cultivation operations, range on the Finger Lakes National Forest in New York. So it's that we're a multiple use agency, so we have a lot of different activities that take place on the National Forest. But this is a building. But this is a what? But this is a building. That's a little different. There are, there are, in the, out in the Western United States, there are recreation residences, private residences, all over the National Forest out there. The AMC huts on the White Mountain National Forest, another example. There are, the, oh, that's run by AMC. There are huts on the National Forest. Huts everywhere. Skis, scariest. Thank you, Chris. Patrice. Patrice Lapatin. Lapatin, I'm sorry. Patrice, Patrice Lapatin. I apologize for not being able to read. Yes, uh, hello. Um, I have to say, I, I was looking at this house uh, that's being proposed. It's certainly not a hut. Can you please put a mic close your mouth? I'm sorry? Yes, okay. So I'm looking at the picture here, which this is the first time I've ever seen what was proposed, and I see that there is a handicap accessible ramp. Now, my question is, how is a handicapped person going to make their way into this structure to be able to use that handicap ramp? That's one question. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, and then the other is that I think a much more logical location for this uh, facility should be in the Moosa Blue campground because of the accessibility of the Goshen Ripton Road. Um, if there was a fire, if there was an emergency, 
that is so much more accessible. And it just seems like a much more logical place. Anybody staying there can make use of all the trails and hike to Silver Lake. They can go up to Goshen Dam and enjoy all of those wonderful places. But this would be a much safer, logical location in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, I just want to address that accessibility issue one more time. So all federal facilities, newly constructed federal facilities, have to meet American with Disabilities Act requirements for accessibility. So even if it's a uh, moldering privy out on the Appalachian Trail that's miles and miles of road, when we reconstruct them, we reconstruct them so that they're accessible. So that if an individual can get to that location, they can use the facility. And as RJ has mentioned a couple of times now, there are a number of different new accessible technologies with bikes and other things that allow people with mobility disabilities or other disabilities to get to these backcountry and remote locations. So that's why these facilities are designed to be accessible. Thank you, Chris. There's nobody else on the list, guys. We've made it. Uh, I, want to, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to make any closing statements, but I would like to thank you guys for being patient, being kind, and listening. And I know that there's opportunities to connect. And, I, and again, I know this is a, a public meeting, but it's, there's a comment period. There's a comment period I think you mentioned. And I think these guys can go over it one more time for you guys to submit specific comments. I'm going to hand over to uh, Angela. Yes, just uh, thank everybody for being here. It, you know, we didn't do this for fun. We did this, uh, and we didn't rally our troops to come here because we knew there would be opposition and we wanted to hear that. And we wanted to hear it person to person, if we could. I know a lot of people wanted it to be remote as well, and, but it's difficult to have it both ways, right? Um, so thank you for being here. We'll take these comments under advisement. Uh, and I would just say, the accessibility thing, because we run Vermont Sports Magazine, we write stories about athletes, people, regular people that do amazing things with disabilities, amazing things. You would be shocked to know where they can go. It is not unrealistic to have people be at huts in the back country. It is just not. They are amazing what they can do out there. So that's a side affair, but just to know that it's a real thing and people really do get out there. Um, thank you again. and. Um, just reach out to us. We're, we're in the book. We're in the phone book. And appreciate your comments. Thank you very much.